here we go. Hello, 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 everyone, um, and welcome. Um, today is Wednesday, April 27th. <laughs> 2022 um and today is our waterside cultures conversation uh, in association with our black recreation theme um for the month of april um and so this month is all about black recreation a term we are using to describe all the ways we work play heal and find joy in public spaces um we we're really interested in just how um, the ways writers are exploring, particularly water and waterside cultures as spaces of journeying, as spaces of healing, um, in connection with themselves and the greater community. Um, and so we invited writers that we loved uh, to really just share sort of just their narratives in association with that theme. Um, and so I'm going to welcome for the, the, our, our writers this evening, starting with Quentin. Quentin Baker is a poet, educator, and Kave Kanam Fellow. Um, his current focus is Black inferiority and the afterlife of slavery. His work has appeared in the Offing Jubilant Vinyl and the Rumpus and elsewhere. He is a two time Pushcart Prize nominee and recipient of the 2018 um, Arts Innovator Award from the Artist Trust. He was a 19, 2019 Robert Rauschenberg Artist in Residence and a 2021 EA. E N E A fellow. He's the author of The Glittering Republic um, and Pilot the Blood, The Third Thing, 2021. Um, so welcome, um, Quentin. Um, so I'm gonna also introduce Malcolm, um, who's also here uh, with us this evening. Uh, Malcolm Tariq is a poet and playwright from Savannah, Georgia. His debut collection, Heed the Hollow, um, is recipient of the 2018 Kaba Khanum Poetry Prize and author, Georgia Author of the Year Award. He is a 2021 to 2020, 2021 resident playwright with Liberation Theater Company and was recently appointed the 2022 Inkwell Poet Laureate. He lives in Brooklyn, New York, where he is the senior manager of editorial projects for prison and justice writing at Pan America. Um, so thank you both for joining us. Um, and for, for everyone else, uh, the format for this evening is, so we'll start with um, Quentin, who will sort of share um, his, his work with us, um, and then we'll quickly uh, pivot to Malcolm. Each writer will have about 15, 20 minutes to sort of share their work with us, and then we'll, um, we'll have a, a moderated Q&A by our communications director, Sierra Peters, um, toward the end of the session. Um, so looking forward to hearing this. Um, thank you all again, and I'll pass it to Quentin. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, honored to be here. Um, and uh, what's up to Malcolm, Kyle Connor, Seven. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm gonna talk just for a couple seconds about what, um, my, how my work intersects with this theme. And then I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read um, a little bit of work for y'all. So um, the book that I'm working on now, uh, it's called Ballast. It's about um, an 1841 slave revolt on a ship called the Creole, uh, which was traveling from Virginia to New Orleans um, in the secondary slave market carrying 135 enslaved people. Um, they were commandeered the ship, and uh, rented a ground in Nassau and gained their freedom um, that way because at that point, Britain had outlawed um, slavery in all of their colonies. So if an enslaved person landed on British soil, they were no longer enslaved. Um, there isn't really a lot about this, uh, despite being the only successful large scale slave revolt involving American born enslaved people. There's um, very little information about it. No one ever took the time to talk to um, people on the ship except for the white crew members. Uh, somebody asked, what's the secondary slave market? So as um, after the transatlantic slave trade was outlawed, um, the slave industry in the United States became self-sustaining because um, slave owners would just, their slaves would have kids and then those kids would be um, their new product. So they didn't need to go to 
uh, you know, Western Africa anymore to take people from their homes. They could just have people that were born into slavery. So the secondary slave market was just people moving within the United States around, usually from the upper South to the deep South, usually because those people were deemed like problem slaves or flight risks, and it was harder to escape from the deep South than the upper South. So um, the ships were like basically just routine transport. Um, and there was a, a person named Madison Washington who led this revolt. Um, and so I just became really interested in this and I became interested in it as like a, uh, you know, sort of a broader understanding of how, um, how black folks survive, how we function, um, how we deal with, uh, you know, these sort of horrible situations, um, and what it means to have survived and to continue to survive. Um, and so for me, that took the form of the ocean of water, like that sort of constancy that, um, you know, what it's meant throughout black history, um, across centuries and centuries of time. Um, so that became really the theme and the motif for me. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to, uh, so the, the project is, is in two parts. There's erasure poems that are redacted, uh, documents um, redacted from an 1840, 1842 Senate document. So I'm going to read some of those. Um, and then I'm going to read some uh, some invented poems, so like invented form poems. Um, oh, is there any way I could share my screen? Is that possible? Absolutely. Let me get you that real quick. Thank you. You can try again. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, these work better. If people can see them. Um, okay. Um, and there's also like, I play this when I read um, these erasures. This wound, this public instrument, this wound, this public instrument, I will not be the fulfillment of the object. was a discovered desire, a loss of quiet. Black in the sun, black after dark, black in the sun, black after dark. bloody possession. We refuse this condition. Come down from blood into birth. Bring the knife Speak down in the long blood, heard, searched, then shut. The night called out in color. The wreck of our pleased hands. They could not kill the sunrise in me. Consider belonging to the slave.
the sea without wound. Um, and then I'll just, I'll read um, some of these other poems from the same project. So it's just like a, uh, essentially just a book length long poem in two different parts. Um, Every break in us is a treatise on the perfect fragile design of being kept. The sail, tobacco leaf, night language of waves, tongues as parcel. Bless the island, bless the dim hum of unslaved, bless each blade we buried in a deserving belly. We are cargo born, ballast, heavy with asking, and then what? This ship, this pit for touch, this hospice, this thief of the haptic, this maroonage, this slaughterhouse for bloom, this eerie lurch toward pillory and ash, curse the bones of it. The open question of our flesh is the echo that orders the ocean, the sonorous snap of the mast we break in ways that please. of flesh as algorithm, of love as cipher, at that brutal crossing we spoil what's linear, unwind chronology, spill the silken oil that demands us grist. We make our music from steady slip or religion, foot slap in a black swamp, paint crash against vaulted fence, a bag full of language and style, there can be no end to us. We are not kinfolk with time. Our clocks read nightmare and relief, our bright variegated things, hands that reach toward redress, release. On this ship, what can be named whole? We sleep on a fixed pattern of chip stone. We sleep bricked in with our beginnings. We sleep in the finished sun. We sleep the ruined moon. We sleep in uniform sewn in. We sleep allergic to ether. We sleep badly behaved. We sleep allergic to home. Frantic return. We sleep in constant bloody arrival. We sleep and we sleep. We sleep swallowing bloom. We are disintegrated black, immune to referent. A sediment spread by repeat burials, a misunderstood continental drift, oceanic trench of record skip, we brutish notes, thugs of the omitted, we parent break into bop, conjugate the aphotic into a flawless pyre, because what is funereal to the dead? We spin multiple graves simultaneous, new vinyl, speech across the deep in ill language, ill suited to surface, misfit for any proper kind of sink. Shoal with the breaking waves, emerge from a spray of clink echo. We rattle ghosts, lithograph of dark lit motion. We wear the history of shatter as ornate cloak. Ocean as tipped bottle of rot perfume, ship as open lesion. We are a season of smoke cornered into consent, ordered to burn. No longer. We gather on shore, emissaries of the abyssal zone, curators of every hadal trench, a deep, black kinetic nutrient exchange and absolute exiguity still yet we anthem toward altar under such ambulatory pressure rhythm should be rendered impossible the whip burns in effigy of the wound lanterns at our hip our steps warn the dusk our nightmares fragment into law redolent phylactery of shell and discard the world attuned to the fragrance of overfed levy is statute of preteen warded to the current, whole anthology, shattered through our entanglement, under red moon chased lightning, we de-legislate latitude, envelop border in kink and curve, collapse the lungs to unlatch the hold, our breath bends all barracoon skyward. Look how far we've come, what adroit steps we set as rigging, what litany, Blade and bullet we pull tight for sale, what breach we bloom bottle against, name whole, guide toward longer breath. Blood don't run toward freedom, it just run. Literal, liturgical, a world-making emulsion, mixture of bone and spirit, unguent for civil society. How many touch thumb to forehead in worship of distance from this watched flesh? Shadow in relief, a sharp wave made canonical through its breaking. 
And then what? Thank you. Wow. Um, first of all, incredible. Um, if y'all have any questions for Quentin, please drop them in the chat. Um, I'm going to hand the floor over to Malcolm. How is my sound now? Your sound is good. Is it better than last time? It is, I think so. Okay. I, I had think to it's go good. in the back end and turn it up. I didn't know that was possible. Um, okay, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Thank you, Quentin, for that excellent reading. Um, the first time I heard Quentin read those was at, at Cave in workshop. I don't know if I was sitting right next to him or like, a few spaces down, but the way he reads, like you feel his presence, like wherever you are. So um, I'm happy that y'all got to experience that. Um, and those those visuals were uh, amazing. Um, so I'm kind of still lost in Quentin's reading, but I'm gonna start. And I, I think a good place to start, um, I'm gonna look at the time, would be, um, this past weekend. So this past weekend, I went to Charleston, South Carolina, which is on the coast of the Carolinas. I'm from Savannah, Georgia, which is two hours south um, on the coast. Um, Savannah and Charleston are like sister cities. They're kind of, they're not the same. Um, Charlestonians think that everything you can do in Savannah, you can do in Charleston better. I would kind of agree, except in Savannah downtown, you could walk around with your drink. Um, you can't do that in Charleston. But Charleston is a really um, nice place, and I think they do a better job at historicizing um, the Black experience before and during the Civil War, so like during slavery. And so when I was doing research for this book, Keith the Hollow, I went to Charleston for a weekend and so I'm going to ground my reading today um, by starting there. This is a place that I don't usually start, but I think um, it calls for it. So this is a poem, now I have to do more explaining. Um, where I went was McLeod Plantation Historic Site, I believe the official name is on James Island in Charleston. And so I went there to look at the tabby cabins, and I'll explain more about that later. And what I found out, one of the things I found out was there's this, near near the house, there is this part of land that's uh, stationed off, sectioned off, and it's called the African American Burial Site. And um, I wrote, so I went there, learned about the site, and basically they wanted to build a firehouse on top of this land. But then when they surveyed it, they found that there were 99 bo bodies, bottles, 99 bodies um, that were buried underground that were so entangled with the earth that they couldn't um, excavate them or identify them. This weekend, I found out that they're trying to um, identify them or something with that. Um, but they didn't build over it, thankfully. And I wrote this poem, the book was published, and then I found out that this white supremacist in Charleston went to several places that were significant to black life in the city and was doing like white power salutes or white supremacy salutations and then walked into a church and killed nine innocent worshipers in Charleston. And so the poem kind of took a different meaning. Um, so I'm gonna start there. This is self-portrait as an unmarked grave. Do not seek the stone without the story, but even it cannot fit this hollow and flesh, flesh shall not fail me. From here, cartilage, collagen, calcium whispers my descent. Witness what I made of ruin. To our kind, death is no descending. Each year, bramble thick with thorn advances its assault. I rise, my dead, my living spill above the earth. Push through blood soil until you are made to stalk. Balance and cruel wind. Tangle of limbs, brown scar, the landscape. Roots refuse to monument my bone. We monument. Carry that in your descendant order. No longer gentle, 
but violet bush evergreening deep in winter's scorn. So the purpose of the poem was kind of to, to serve as a monument for those people who are buried there, who we don't know um, who they are. And it's near, it's on James Island. So it's near, um, I forget the name of the river, but the river is just so close to it, um, which inspired much of the poem. So also when I was in Charleston in 2017, I learned that, I learned about Sullivan's Island. And so for a very long time during the slave trade in the U.S., especially in the early days, um, slave ships would come through Sullivan's Island. The Africans would quarantine on Sullivan's Island for like months at a time before they went to auction downtown. And this is an island, um, also Fort, Fort Moultrie on that island was used during World War One or two, I believe, as like a Navy base. And so if you go there today, most of the um, historical, signif si historical significance is based on um, when it was used for the military. And there's this one placard that basically tells about um, how most African-Americans in the U.S., most Black people in the U.S. can trace their heritage back to Sullivan's Island. So it's kind of like the Black Ellis Island. And I didn't know this for many years. And so this is a poem I wrote called On Sullivan's Island. And just to um, paint the picture, I wanted to, and I've never been able to successfully do this, but Quentin, when you played that audio at the beginning, um, the water there is so loud. It's a beach, but it's, it's probably the loudest beach I've ever heard. And it's so deep that there's um, a particular sign that tells you not to go out and swim. On Sullivan's Island, I heed a path trotted for me before. I am this impaired, forgetting and forgetting and forgetting. What else is this wave crashing into shore but an attempt to cleave remembrance? Overhead, the dark sky engulfs the low country, once welcome spot and terror for the ancestors always a nest for the captors. Now baby, now baby strollers and casual dog walks file before a single marquee meant to hold place for history. Leisure were once labor. What work have I come here to do besides witness? I go from shore to shore seeking, seeking clarity to stand on the threshold of past and present where land and sea court death. I search my mind for what remains of generational sanity. There is nothing but bondage. Ahead, the sign reads, deadly currents, deep holes, and forbids the swim out. I could chase the distance with salt. I could run face forward into what has already claimed me. This ocean swallows the whole of me. I could join it or become another buoy signaling lost. And from there, actually, I don't know if this is correct geographically, but the Dismal Swamp is, a sw I think it's like the largest swamp in the country it must be. It, it takes, it covers like three or four states, and I should have gotten drawn to be more accurate about this, but I rarely read this poem because it, um, it's not difficult to read. It just takes a lot. Um, but the Dismal Swamp is a place, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote, was she right? Uncle Tom's Cabin? She wrote a book um, after that called Dread, and it was based in the Dismal Swamp about Black enslaved people who fled to the swamps to escape slavery. And so they basically made a life for themselves in the swamp. And I don't know if you've ever been in a swamp, but a swamp is... Um, it's a very dangerous place because I, I kind of think of a swamp as like a boundless, a boundless area because the water is so deep, but also very um, suffocating. Uh, then there's also the trees. It's like a very tropical, but also deadly place. Um, this poem is called Drapetomania. Drapetomania was, um, I don't know if it was a legal mental illness, but it was a condition that a white man thought of in his head 
in which described a black person who wanted to flee slavery was considered mad. Um, and it was a mental illness. So this is a drape, this is poem is called Drape to Mania. It's um, a contrapuntal. I'm gonna just show you if you can see it. There's two columns, one big column and one small column. A contrapuntal just means you can read a poem in three different ways. Is my lighting okay? Okay. So I'm gonna read one panel, the second panel, and then the whole thing. No, I'm gonna read the whole thing, the le left panel, and then the right panel. Forgive the swamp, it's magic niggers and mischief to grab onto them who flee in the crook of his mouth and wait one death for another, for whispers to become rooted in miles of muck, to run from the crocodile's teeth, but never back to the crack of whips here in waters housing the thickness of death and birth entangled in ropes of smog themselves, choosing to brave the swamp to bring back desire sick with the will to return. Forgive the swamp, its magic and mischief to grab onto them in the crook of its mouth and one death for another to become rooted in miles of muck from the crocodile's teeth, but never to the crack of whips here housing the thickness of death, entangled in ropes of smog, choosing to brave the swamp, to bring desire sick with the will to return. Niggers who flee wait for whispers to run back to, in waters and birth themselves back to life. And I'm probably gonna read two more. Well, yes, I was gonna read a different one, but I'll read two more. So we started in Charleston, then we came down to the Dismal Swamp. Um, and now we're gonna go to where I'm from, Savannah, and the surrounding Sea Islands. The Sea Islands actually are not just, they're off the coast of Georgia and South Carolina in this little pocket. And, um, I'm not going to go too much into the Gullah Geechee cultures and communities just because I never really talk much about them. But um, the next poem I'm read the next poem I'm going to read takes place. No, I'm going to switch it up. I'm going to switch it up. But I do want to describe Tabby. It's Tabby to you. So Tabby is this material. If you can see it, it's like a cement-like material. Um, that features oyster shells usually. This is a candle my friend got me. Um, but the cover of the book is a picture I took when I went to, not Sullivan's Island, Sapelo Island off of Georgia. Um, and growing up, I was not surrounded by tabby, but it was like a regular thing that I would see mainly downtown. And later, after I left Georgia and lived other places, I realized that I've never seen tabby outside of the South. And then I learned that it was a material that was made mostly by enslaved people during the colonial period. And it's made from water, ash, limestone, oyster shells, sand. So all these things, it's, it's, a, 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 it's a material that you have to make if you live on the coast. You have to live on the coast to make this material, I should say. And so a lot of the, so right now it's like a decorative thing, like you can, if you go to Savannah or Charleston, you can see it like on the sidewalks or sometimes the buildings are still made with tabby, but it's a, a manufactured tabby. But if you go to places like um, McLeod uh, to Sapelo, which I'm gonna talk about soon, you'll see that real tabby. Um, and this is from, you know, 17, 1800s. What I'm gonna do is now take us to Tybee Island, which is the beach where I grew up near I didn't go there a lot, just, we just didn't go there a lot. Um, but this is a poem about growing up with Tabby around you in life. Um, and I'll just, I'll say that. On Tybee Island, I heed a path trotted, bef trotted for me before. I am this fragile, foraging and foraging and foraging. What else is there but the abandoned shells beneath my feet that I must rescue? At home, I place their hollow against my own, finding 
Once more, the unforgivable howl and sway of the ocean, its retreat and return. In my parents' day, I was not allowed here. Jim Crow wagged his dry finger in our faces through us inland. A child, what did I know about boundaries? And leaned my tender body inward into a shell, longing for the promise of the shore. In the city, they taught me. The abandoned, once more broken carnage cradled by cement that makes up the walls of buildings I touch, the houses I live in. Once more, the voice held hostage in the same sidewalks my body performs its deflecting. I turn about, forever facing east, forever face black, limbs dark rolls of tide water I've learned to contort into obedience. When, when the ocean calls me, it isn't that hard to obey. On Tybee Island, where they did not want us splash, splayed into the shore, I return to the site of injury, my body this many ways controlled, this many ways broken, this many ways I will reclaim. Somewhere there is always an I for me or against. There is my parents' aching plea to conform. Okay, last one, I promise. This, and now we're gonna end on Sapelo Island. Um, chocolate plantation where they still have tabby ruins that they house the enslaved black people in. It's on um, the north side of Sapelo. And you actually read, this is a, um, a poem about me and my little brother. It's actually a great place to stop. Uh, my brother's 16 years younger than me. So it's a trip that my cousin took me on when I was like 16. And I took my brother when he was 10. Um, this is like four or five years ago. The Road to Chocolate Plantation. One, we leave Savannah in search of searching. My foot weighs down the road for an hour until we cross over into Meridian a journey I've taken before, not in this seat, but following my cousin's curious eye for history. At 16, I understood then what I can't recall today. I remember the drive, the walk to the shore, and the bus ride into Sapelo. I remember picking at a charred mullet fish fresh from the water, roaming the Heritage Festival, scanning a Bible in Gullah, native and not. Today, there is none of that only the deeper search of remembrance and belonging, capturing some stable place between rippling gray water and shore. I drive further. In the back, my baby brother's head bobs against the window, his first journey already courting sleep. Two, at the port, we board the school bus. It's rickety machinery aged, but useful carries us into the island, past Behavior Cemetery, past the post office, past into another past. The tour guide's heavy foot plunges further and we lurch into the dense coastal Georgia bush, the stick-like trunks tall and fallen, the spiky growth of small palm trees waving us through. Beneath us, the red earth brambles up after yesterday's rain, the puddles bound to form rivers that could swallow us, here on an island nearly lost to memory. We trudge forward and I see myself and my brother sitting across from me as if on a school field trip, unsure of the destination, but down for the ride. Three, at Chocolate Plantation, I heed a path trotted for me before. I am this studious, furthering and furthering and furthering. What else is there but the tabby walls crushed beneath my feet, nearly forgotten? Like me, they too were shaped by the hands of ancestors. Beyond, my brother walks through and in the historical, not privied to the storied. At 10 years old, he looks for the shells that have fallen from brick. Those dislodged are never having found place in stone. I wonder what he will take from this and search for narrative placing the hollow against my own for a voice, a whisper, a sigh. We explore separately, 
17 years between us and what we believe to know about heritage. In the end, we each take what we need to survive. On an opposite shore, I ask what he has learned, that the slaves made these, he says, holding forth his collection of fragile fossil. He is the smarter one, having taken narrative into his own hands before its forgetting, using more than his ear for the listening. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, that was, I, I'm just so in awe. Um, there are so many wonderful, you know, comments in the chat. So amazing. This is incredible. Uh, so powerful. I can see, smell, taste, and hear the sound of anticipation and disappointment of the people reading the poetry. Yes, yes. Thank you both. Um, I mean, you both, this is, I can't stop ex uh, exclaiming. So um, please add your questions to the chat, but I'll get us started. Um, you know, I, I'm really, I, I don't really have, you know, we don't have much time here, but I don't really have a lot of like fully formed questions. They're mostly like reflections and provocations based on what I've heard and some notes that I took as y'all were reading, um, but I did pre-prepare some. So <laughs> the first one, when I think across Black literature, like Beloved, In the Wake, for example, um, water often conjures the idea of like wreckages, the idea that we have no ground, that we have no space, um, you know, and it originates with and is haunted by the waters of the Middle Passage. My first introduction to another form of representation actually came by way of Drexia, um, which is an Afrofuturistic techno group that talks about the mythology or has a mythology around um, the women, the children of the women who were thrown overboard and what their lives would be in the water. Um, and they're all mermaids and they're beautiful. Um, and so, you know, there is a beyond to these uh, traumatic associations. Like we can find examples of water as a loving embrace. So I'd love if you could first, um, before we dive into the heavy stuff, reflect on waterside cultures, black beaches, aquatic communities as an escape from land. It could be like Provincetown, South Carolina, the Caribbean, wherever you found yourself. And I will pass it to whoever feels, you know, so moved to answer first. Like, for me, that's a tough question. Like, uh, I think because, like, I grew up in Seattle, I live in Seattle, so it's like, I am on the water, but also very much not in a black space uh, at all. Um, you know, so, and I honestly, I haven't done, um, like I haven't traveled that much. I'm like very much a introvert living the hermetic lifestyle. It's like, I really don't go anywhere. There's a lot of, there's a ton of places I would love to go. So for me, I think like, it's something I primarily experienced through uh the like the the literature that i appreciate like so when you ask me that question what i think of is idea hartman um how to lose like lose your mother because i think of that book i think of like her in ghana trying to like make sense of where she is and her surroundings um and what it means to be in a space like that as a like descendant of slaves back and sort of that, like the tension that she has throughout that book with, um, you know, the residents of West Africa, like that, all that, that kind of texture for me, um, reading that was like, uh, sort of like, I, I guess a healing experience of like understanding um, multiple sides to this breach that we've all been forced to experience um, and the ways that she like formed connections across that breach, I think like as praxis for um, 
you know, what community in those spaces looks like. So it's funny, we, you know, started out with like, what does community love look like? And like, this idea is showing it in that book, like, how do you connect in this space um, with this kind of breach as it's represented by like this, this coast of a continent? I don't, I don't think, well, I know this, my family didn't really um, go in the water like that when I was growing up, even though we are from Savannah, like we, like I read that poem about Tybee Island, but we really didn't go to the beach. Um, and I thought it just was because it was just like an everyday thing until I traveled and realized not everybody has a beach that they can go to all the time. Um, but I mean, a lot of it was, I mean, Black people weren't allowed, allowed on Tybee Island. They were allowed on a certain part of Tybee Island for a while. And my there are never any stories that come up about my mom and her siblings or my dad, like on a beach setting. Um, and we had a couple of people in our family who like drowned in like accidents, even though they were good swimmers. And so there's always this contested thing with water and on my mom's side. Um, a lot of us don't know how to swim. And so I think that writing, but being from a place like Savannah, where we like under sea level, like the water is very like present, um, especially during hurricane season. Um, and so I think writing these poems were a way for me to, to connect with the power and Black people's connection to water and um, like what's in it and that we can like go into the water and like be one with it. So I'm st still working on that, but yeah. That's real. Thank you both for your honesty and candor. Um, Vicky, I'm gonna ask you, do you wanna uh, ask your question out loud or would you like me to read it for you? Um, it may be a little more, read it and see if they can, if they understand and I'll elaborate a little bit more. Okay. Um, so Vicky asks, how can you both read your poetry and still be able to separate yourselves from the poetry? Um, for me, I don't. Uh, you know, for me, my work is uh, a big part of who I am, probably most of who I am uh, in terms of like what I spend my time and, and focus and energy on. Um, I mean, I do like... Uh, you know, when you're writing and, and researching and reading about difficult things or painful things, uh, like it's, it's important to try and take care of yourself, but also, um, you know, the work kind of demands a, a full level of immersion. So um, for me, you know, the concept of care or uh, like any type of separation happens after I'm done um, with the project. And then once I've once I finish the manuscript or or or, or whatever, um, then I think there's kind of a a natural separation that happens from when a project is finished, and I'm no longer actively working on it. Um, but yeah, aside from that, uh, you know, I I I I try to stay connected um, because I, it I, it means something to me, and there's stakes in it for me, and I want that to be, uh, you know, a part of it. I, I read this question differently actually at first because I never even thought of, um, like Quentin was saying, like you can't really separate the two. Like I never even thought about the question being read in that way. I, I was thinking about it in terms of separating um, the subjectivity of myself in the poems from who I am as a person. And so my, my answer was initially the I isn't always me in the poems. And so this book especially was written as, I see it as like a document and it it covers like um, a collective history and experience of Black queer Southern life. Um, and in that sense, I think that helps me sometimes where I'm able to realize that the I that I am not always the I. And so I'm writing for more than just myself, but also myself. Um, and I don't even know if after the thing is published, if if I can separate myself. I think there is, a, oh, good point, Quentin. I think there is a separation after it's away from me that when I come back to it, I 
I notice things, but I don't really take it personal. I take it as, oh, this is my child and now I'm learning about you. Um, and so today when I was reading, there was a line that I read and I almost stopped because I'm like, oh, that comes up in another place. I didn't even know that I had written something similar like that. But yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Um, so uh, we just have a couple more minutes. We don't want to go too much over time, but I do see a reflection from Louise. Um, Louise says, I remember when the bus, when the number 10 bus went from Deadly Station to City Point, Pleasure Bay, um, when the Orange Line was taken down from, used to go to Copley Street, I'm sorry. Um, you know, and she talks about uh, busing, um, busing being closed for Black people to go to the beach. So thank you for that reflection. Mm -hmm. Um, Louise, a little bit of Boston history. Um, <laughs> they used to use Pleasure Bay when they took the orange line down, not number 10 to go to Copley Square instead. Mm. Yes, yeah, when the orange line used to go through uh, the black neighborhoods, um, but they switched, it used to go overhead, right? Like it used to be above ground, but when they switched to underground, it went through all of the white neighborhoods, which was yes. a really interesting planning uh, decision. Interesting to say the least. And I think um, when they talked about black drowning, they said because blacks have been denied access to the beach so much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so they don't get as much swimming lessons as the whites do. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, all types of segregation around here, around the waterside cultures. Thank you, Louise. Um, so for Quentin, uh, can you tell us more about your book project? Uh, can you say what it's called again? Um, yeah, I just love to hear more about how this might complement or differ from your previous book projects. Um, yeah, so it's called Ballast. Uh, it is coming out maybe next year. Um, from Haymarket Books, um, and it's it's I've been I worked I started working on it in 2016 2015 actually, um, and so it, it's very much different from uh, the rest of my work, um, you know like so Malcolm's interpretation of of the separate question is interesting because for me that's what. I guess this project is, um, I think my work before this was sort of like a mixture of historical um, and autobiographical. And then this work is just, it's um, sort of, it's like a, you know, a non narrative, again, another word Malcolm put in this space, um, you know, polyvocal polyphonic work. So it's really um, the any I or we or first person pronoun in the text is not me at all. So it's it's very much a um, uh, in terms of form. Um, I've never done any kind of visual work before, so the erasure, all that stuff is new. Um, the invented form. Um, so all of that is really a, a departure for me. Um, so like formally, content wise, um, sort of a, a lack of an autobiographical eye. All that stuff is 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 very different. Mm. Thank you. Um, I love that. And then for Malcolm, um, you know, you talked about poems as monuments, uh, like trying to cover and care for people through writing. When did you come to that idea? And like, what, what, yeah, how did you come to that idea? And like, when did you start writing in that way? I don't know. I think a lot of the poetry that I was reading, especially for from Black women and then from Black Southerners were about like documenting experiences. And so Natasha Trethewey a lot, Lucille Clifton, um, Gwendolyn Brooks, even though she wasn't Southern, but. And so when I was writing this, it kind of, um, I didn't want it to be like that personal. And so that's the only really reason, like I'm really into how I really am a student of history, but I'm not like a historian. And so using my poetry for that kind of um, puts, you know, one of my feet in the game for some things, but not everything. And I'm, I'm just really into how poetry can like carry history and heritage without, um, in a way that is accessible, but also requires interpretation and allows space for people to fit in and get in where they can. Um, and it's something that, you know, like I said earlier, like I just realized something about this poem I was reading, like 
poetry is something that you can come back to at different stages in your life and connect to it in different ways. You can do that with history too, but um, with poetry, it's a two-way art form, low key. And so that's, that's, I think, why I'm attracted to poetry like that. Yeah, it hits different. It definitely hits different. Um, so, uh, Mo, do you want to ask your question out loud or would you like me to read it? Uh, you can go ahead and read it. Yeah, um, I was just asking, this is for Quentin, um, how do you decide what to redact in your practice? What guides your field of vision? Um, this is a question about how you read and approach your archive. Um, and I'm really glad to um, have witnessed both of these readings. Thank you very much. And also, if I may, um, have a question for um, Malcolm as well. Um, if you could please uh, talk a little bit about uh, the hollow and, um, you know, what... Um, yeah, what does the hollow yield? Uh, I, 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 I like the instruction, heed the hollow, um, but I'm wondering what we find there um, collectively. What does your, you know, um, your anthology suggest about the um, potential of hollowness, which I heard sort of resonate and echo um, throughout various um, poems that you read this evening. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um... I would say that uh, for me through the process of reduction, um, you know, again, I'm gonna just use Malcolm's answers for everything. Uh, like the concept of being a lover of history and a student of history, but not of a historian is important for me. And also um, finding a, a way in to history, I think is one of, is like for me the project of historical poetry. So, um, uh, my process for this, so it's one document. It's a 1942 Senate document. Um, my process is was rage mostly. Um, I was, I was mad. I was hot that there was there were 135 people, um, and no one saw fit to record their voices or their language. Um, but of course they had voice, of course they had language, of course they had an interior reality. Um, so my approach to the text was, how can I find, like I'm, I can't, I don't deign to speak for anyone. I don't deign to say I, I can ex excavate their voice, um, but I just wanted to search the document for anything that felt like an echo, that felt like, um, a resonance that was beneath the surface of of what was being said, because what was in the document was depositions from white crew members and back and forth between um, American and British consulates in the Bahamas. Um, so really, I just I felt like the original document was an erasure, um, an erasure of black life and erasure of black interiority, and I just wanted to dig at it until something emerged that to me felt like. Um, an echo of interiority that I that I could recognize. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, firstly, I don't know why Quinn keeps using my words because Quinn's a very smart person. <laughs> and when I said polyvocal earlier, I was like, I can't. I hope that's the right word in front of Quinn because Quinn will just sometimes like say stuff. You're like, where where'd you get that from? And you know, he just has a lot of knowledge. Um, so what does the hollow yield? Um, that is a very heavy question. I'll say that the, the book starts with a poem called Power Bottom, and then it ends in a poem called Bottom Power. And so to me, um, not so much, uh, how do I say this? Not so much hollowness, but uh, I guess, you know, there's a room, there's a lot of room in, in hollowness. And so, um, and a lot of this book is talking about desire and pleasure and, and about like bottoming or the concept of a bottom. And so to me, it's about like owning that hollowness and then making it a hollowness that is informed by your own experience, but also history, and then finding power in whatever that you can't necessarily claim, but you kind of know to be true. Um, because I believe there are, there's not like one truth. There are like several truths. And a lot of time truth is, is relative to 
one person's. Um, and I don't know if I'm answering this question correctly in a, a, a PG way, but no, you certainly are. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to be PG. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but yeah, I think that covers it. Um, uh, yeah, I'll say that. Mm. Um, I'm going to, that's our last question. We are way over time. An hour and 15 minutes was not enough. We got to bring y'all back. Um, hopefully in person, if we are so blessed. Um, thank you both so much for joining us today, um, for sharing your work and for answering all of our questions. This was such a lovely time. Um, we're going to say bye to YouTube now. Bye YouTube.